all right so uh, good evening everyone uh, dear students so uh, today uh, we will uh, start with uh, uh, yet another integrated round uh, of medicine and uh, pharma so uh, in the form of the uh, mcqs so uh, let's start with this uh, clinical case and uh, this clinical case uh, we will start from the uh, basics that is history and uh, uh, clinical points and then we will move to the pathogenesis and then followed by the uh, management of this uh, clinical disorder so uh, starting with this uh, uh, clinical case so a uh, patient uh, is 25 year old female uh, presented with uh, abdominal pain for the last 6 months so history is a uh, chronic history of uh, the uh, abdominal uh, pain last 6 months Uh, pain was infrequent initially but uh, uh, pain episodes are now two to three times in a week uh, for the last three months uh, these pain episodes are present three months other complaint of the patient uh, patient has a increased stool frequency and loose stool consistency these are the positive uh, history findings which are being mentioned here now in the negative history which is uh, equally important uh, here is no history of weight loss no history of fever no history of blood in the stools and no history of fatty stools so why these histories are taken uh, because if there was a history of fever fever history is to rule out any infection or inflammatory cause so this is suggestive of some inflammatory cause same as the blood in the stools inflammatory cause while fatty stools fatty stools uh, if positive uh, they will suggest a uh, fat malabsorption so uh, that means ki a case of a steatorrhea steatorrhea means uh, some sort of malabsorption some sort of malabsorption and this weight loss history is some organic disease organic disease it can range from the inflammatory bowel disease it can range from malabsorption syndrome or it can range from uh, carcinomas or cancers so these are some uh, serious issues ibd malabsorption and cancer uh, they will lead to the weight loss so therefore negative history is equally important uh, to ask uh, from the patient Uh, because of the uh, clinical features so based on this the information which is giving given to us that patient has altered bowel habits will with loose stools and abdominal pain so what will be our most likely clinical uh, diagnosis here so this is the question to you so the what is the likely diagnosis in this case uh, a option is celiac sprue b option is crohn's disease c is irritable bowel syndrome or d is ulcerative colitis so celiac sprue basically leads to the malabsorption syndrome so malabsorption syndrome means patient will have most common abnormality of malabsorption syndrome and that will be uh, steatorrhea but it is not present in our clinical scenario also a uh, patient uh, in uh, celiac sprue will have a weight loss history because of the malabsorption which is not present yes all of you are right this will be a case of irritable bowel syndrome why not crohn's and ulcerative colitis because these are inflammatory bowel disease uh, there will be blood in stools as well as inflammation weight loss fever will be there so same for the ulcerative colitis uh, these things uh, will be there for ulcerative colitis so the best answer here will be uh, irritable bowel syndrome but is it really a irritable bowel syndrome we have to prove the criteria so my next question to you is what is the criteria used for the irritable bowel syndrome diagnosis out of this is it universal definition 
रोम फोर क्राइटेरिया लाइट्स क्राइटेरिया और द ड्यूक्स क्राइटेरिया फॉर इरिटेबल बाउल सिंड्रोम सो द क्वेश्चन इज वेरी इजी ऑप्शन आर इजी यूनिवर्सल डेफिनेशन यूनिवर्सल डेफिनेशन इज फॉर डायग्नोसिस ऑफ माओकार्डियल इन्फॉक्शन इट इज फॉर एम आई वाइल लाइट्स क्राइटेरिया इज फॉर एक्सुडेटिव प्लूरल इफ्यूजन इट इज फॉर एक्सुडेटिव प्लूरल इफ्यूजन यस एंड ड्यूक्स क्राइटेरिया इज फॉर द डायग्नोसिस ऑफ इन्फेक्टिव एंडोकार्डाइटिस इन्फेक्टिव एंडोकार्डाइटिस तो द आंसर इज इट इज अ रोम फोर क्राइटेरिया which is used for the diagnosis of the irritable bowel syndrome so let's see whether our patient fit into this criteria or the other uh, answer was just a diagnosis of exclusion so what is the room for criteria the room for criteria is essential criteria essential patient should have abdominal pain now understand the frequency very uh, carefully and the duration very carefully this abdominal pain should be at least one day per week at least one day per week should be the frequency for last 3 months so understand here the pain frequency of one day per week should be present for the last 3 months but the total duration of the symptom symptom duration should be more than 6 months what that that means that means the abdominal pain can be infrequent can be less than one day per week but it was present for more than 6 months and this frequency was present for the last 3 months this frequency should be present for the last 3 months but the symptom onset should be more than 6 months total duration of the symptoms it is plus this is the essential criteria plus more than 2 of 3 associated criteria and those one of the three criteria are means essential should be present always plus two of the three that means the pain increased by defecation number 2 there will be a change in stool frequency there should be a change in the stool frequency that means ki it can be either way uh, means it can increase or it can decrease number 3 there should be a change in stool consistency both ways it may be from uh, the towards the solid side or it can be towards the loose consistency side so these are the three associated symptoms any of these two symptoms plus the essential is the room for criteria now let's apply this in the clinical scenario is it satisfying the diagnostic criteria or not so let's move back to the clinical history so look at the clinical history once again patient has essential criteria here that is uh, abdominal pain this is essential criteria abdominal pain and the duration of the abdominal pain or the symptom is 6 uh, months so that is fitting and this uh, uh, pain episodes for the last 3 months have achieved a frequency of 2 to 3 times in a week where more than one uh, day per week is sufficient to make a diagnosis so yes essential criteria is satisfied now look at the associated two criteria 
so associated to criteria which are present here are increased stool frequency means the change in the stool frequency yes and loose stool consistency yes so one essential and two associated criteria are present so uh, definitely this is a case of a irritable bowel syndrome now clinically uh, other things uh, which uh, might be uh, given to you to make a diagnosis uh, on the basis of the clinical information uh, that will be the clinical uh, features so the clinical feature of the ibs if we look at other clinical features of ibs which will help you in making a diagnosis this can be divided into the positive clinical features means they are supportive they are supportive they support the diagnosis they are not in the criteria but they will support the diagnosis negative clinical features what the meaning of the negative clinical feature ki if they are present they rule out the diagnosis so in that scenario you should not make a diagnosis of ibs if any one of these are present so what is the uh, supportive criteria supportive criteria is onset less than 45 years of age onset of the altered bowel habits less than 45 first possibility should go for ibs but if it was a 70 years of age then the first possibility should have been malignancy altered bowel habits while number 2 is there will be uh, vomiting as well so vomiting does not rule out it can support the diagnosis of the ibs if vomiting is present number 3 abdominal tenderness will be present number 4 these symptom by the patient like use of these words flatulence straining bloating by the patient flatulence like gas banna straining the means ki high pressure is needed uh, to pass the stools or bloating number 5 increased symptoms during in females during the menstrual cycle increase symptom during the menstrual cycle so these uh, are supported these are supported equally important is a negative means they should not be present if they are present it will rule out the diagnosis like weight loss never happens here. blood in stools does not occur number 3 patient will never wake up from the sleep to pass stools nocturnal diarrhea will not be seen nocturnal diarrhea is uh, characteristic of the uh, inflammatory bowel disease ulcerative colitis so ulcerative colitis patient has to wake up in the night to pass the uh, stools because uh, during the night time the food particles or stool reaches the uh, inflamed colon so that irritate the colon and the patient will have a urge for defecation but in uh, the case of irritable bowel syndrome never you see nocturnal diarrhea and as well as uh, this will not produce any inflammatory signs like there will should will not be any high tlc high esr will never be present in cases of irritable bowel syndrome so these are the negative that is the negative diagnosis so this is the clinical feature of the irritable bowel syndrome so dr saurav uh, 
uh, we are coming to the etiopathogenesis and that is the question now come to what is the etiopathogenesis so we come to this topic etiopathogenesis of ibs so etiopathogenesis of the ibs are uh, a hypothesis and one of the hypothesis is the uh, central nervous system so the central nervous system uh, have specific areas for ibs like uh, whenever there is a stress uh, ibs is a stress related uh, whenever there is a stress uh, irritable bowel syndrome increase so why is that so so etiopathogenesis number 1 is the cns areas which are active in irritable bowel syndrome patients so what these cns area do uh, they modulate the autonomic system and uh, a patient will have loose motions or constipation so they uh, uh, change the behavior of the patient they change the autonomic functions of the body so these areas in the brain so question is the cns areas are associated with the irritable bowel syndrome so answer to this question is the prefrontal cortex as well as this area mid cingulate cortex and they are responsible for the autonomic modulation in response to some sort of stress in response to some sort of stress and uh, all of you know that uh, the autonomic system affect the bowel area bowel movements so that is one of the proposed mechanism number 1 is cns number 2 number 2 proposed mechanism of the etiopathogenesis is number 2 it is the increased or altered expression of ht3 receptors in the bowel altered expression that is the second uh, etiopathogenesis that ht3 receptor 3 st3 receptor or st4 receptors uh, so these ht3 receptor five st3 receptors what is their function normal function is that they increase the motility of the intestine they increase the secretions in the intestine so if they are more expressed there will be diarrhea if they are less expressed in the intestine the constipation will be there so they modulate the uh, motility and the secretions so that is the second uh, etiopathogenesis for the uh, irritable bowel syndrome now the third one the third one is our question is post infectious post infectious post infection means ki infection uh, was there maybe 6 months back or maybe 1 year back infection occurred and after the infection what happens there is a prolonged increase permeability of the mucosa prolonged infection has gone or maybe infection is present in a very sub clinical uh, dose sub clinical dose means ki pathogenic bacteria was present in a very low quantity that it was not causing a clinical disease at that time but because of that permeability of the intestinal mucosa was increased and permeability of the mucosa is increased there is more secretion of the electrolyte more secretion of the electrolytes so what are these post infectious causes the post infectious causes are is your question next question so question is 
which infection can lead to ivs salmonella shigella compylobacter or none of the above or none of the above so answer is uh, these post infection for this so the answer will not be none answer is true true and true indeed this is the most common cause of ivs compylobacter all of them are true all of them are true but compylobacter is the most common cause and the mechanism is increasing the mucosal permeability so electrolyte loss and water loss can be there so that is responsible for the uh, symptom of the ivs and uh, the fourth mechanism is the fourth pathogenic is altered gut microbiota alter gut um, uh, microbiota means ki the flora normal flora is disturbed maybe the proposed mechanism is ki proteolytic bacteria are increased proteolytic bacteria are increased or saccharolytic bacteria are increased they lead to the increase fermentation increase fermentation and increase fermentation means uh, there is more carbon dioxide gas released abdominal distension they are responsible for the bloating and distension of the abdomen because they have a property of causing a fermentation of the fermentation especially the uh, saccharides like oligosaccharides monosaccharides they can ferment it so uh, therefore in the treatment uh, which dr thiru will also discuss ki how we will address these issues of the etiopathogenesis so this was the topic uh, uh, of the uh, irritable bowel syndrome i was talking about the altered gut microbiota and uh, that altered gut microbiota means the uh, increase of any particular flora increase in the particular flora so uh, that will lead to the if bacteria is more there will be increased fermentation and fermentation means ki carbon dioxide will be more produced distension of the abdomen occur and in the management aspect we will uh, try to address these etiopathogenesis issues like uh, post infectious cause we can give antibiotic only antibiotic approved Uh, for altered gut microbiota we can give uh, uh, probiotics as well so this uh, treatment aspect so i will ask dr thiru to uh, put some light on this uh, management of the ibs how we will treat the ibs the management of the ibs so i will stop sharing my slide over to dr thiru thank you sir thank you ramesh sir good evening to all first of all my heartfelt thanks to dr arvind sir for uh joining today for the integrated session <clears throat> sir my voice is audible sir my screen is visible sir uh, your voice is audible clear okay thank you sir thank you sir so out of the outset my dear students today we have a great session we are going to have that is management of ibs irritable syndrome Sir has mentioned elaborately about the uh, clinical history and diagnosis, etiopathogenesis. From that, I am going to continue. See, actually, a yeah, irritable bowel syndrome patient usually present with the sir mentioned the common clinical symptoms. They have, they have either constipation, dominant type of irritable bowel syndrome. or they have diarrheal dominant type of ibs syndrome and they also have symptoms of abdominal pain spasmodic abdomen and most importantly they have abdominal distension gaseous abdominal distension on bloating sensation these are the classical symptoms of ibs so how to manage this problems to the point 
when you talk about constipation dominant type of IBS, for treating this condition, what we have? One, for treatment of constipation dominant type of irritable syndrome, we have number one, laxative agents. Number two, we have prokinetic agents. Number three, we have something called secretagogues, intestinal secretagogues. Those going to increase fluid secretion, those going to increase chloride secretion. Those going to increase chloride secretion and fluid secretion. They call secretagogue. Now, to start with laxative, we have different, different type of laxative agents. First and foremost will be, we can start with the osmotic laxative like magnesium hydroxide. You know magnesium itself causing diarrhea. So if there's a constipation dominant variety, we can start magnesium. So we may discuss aluminum hydroxide, magnesium hydroxide. Aluminum causes constipation, magnesium causing diarrhea. So magnesium sulfate hydroxide can also. And polyethylene glycol, all these has osmotic effects, thereby promoting defecation reflux, thereby useful for treatment of constipation dominant IBS. And other group will be we have bulk forming laxative. Bulk forming laxative. Those going to increasing stool bulk. By increasing the stool bulk, the iliocolic reflux will be promoted. The defecation sensation can be promoted, thereby useful for treatment of constipation. For example, high fiber diets and methyl cellulose. The methyl cellulose is under very good bulk forming agent, thereby going to promote the defecation reflux. Of course, we can also try other laxatives like lactulose and sorbitol syrup can also try it. Here one another important question. Lactulose, one of the laxative useful for treatment of constipation. Of course, you should also know lactulose also useful in the management of hepatic encephalopathy. Hepatic encephalopathy. This is also important point. Okay. So question, find out the laxative having role in the management of hepatic encephalopathy lactulose. So one group of drug useful for treatment of constipation domain. Now, we are discussing about laxative agents. In the laxative agents, we discussed lactulose useful for hepatic encephalopathy and it's also one of the useful for constipation domain IBS. The another important group of drug useful are prokinetic agents. Come on. We have some prokinetic agent useful for treatment of constipation domain IBS. Here, one important group of drug called 5 t 4 agonist, serotonin agonist. Here, the latest drug is purgulopride. Please note them, purgulopride, one of the 5 t 4 agonists. It's an FDA approved drug for treatment of constipation domain IBS. Okay. Okay. Now, the another important drug is Tegazirod. Look here. Tegazirod, one of the biggest organisms useful for IBS, but this drug causes risk of QT prolongation. Because of causing QT prolongation, it was withdrawn from market. It was withdrawn, but, but this drug again reintroduced. Please remember, it is again reintroduced for treatment of constipation dominant IBS. If no other options available in less than 65 year old female, in less than 60 year old female, if they have no risk of heart problem, when there is no risk of heart problem, we can use them tegazerol. So normally, among the 5 t 4 agonists, a safest drug is progolopride. It is a safest drug. But even tegazerol also useful. But we say tegazerol, a 5 t 4 agonist, 
that is causing QT prolongation, it was withdrawn and sometime back. But it was reintroduced. Remember, reintroduced. But still we use him. But be careful in heart patient. That is, if there's already some, some risk factor, already some MI patient in the patient, don't try it as all. In non-cardiac, I mean, no risk mean, then we can try. Otherwise, best priced for agonist for T1 dog, quant patients, prograloprine. And then, we have some secure dog. This is what most important for your MCQ purpose. Very, very, very important. There are newer drugs, secret of gobs. That is, there are some drugs going to improve the intestinal secretion. For example, for example, look here. We have something called linoclartide and plicanotide. Please note them. Linoclartide and plicanotide. Please note this one. Linoclartide and plicanotide. These two drugs are Guanyl cyclase C stimulator. Guanyl cyclase C stimulator. By activating the guanyl cyclase enzyme, they are going to activate CFTR. CFTR means cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis transmembrane regulator. Transmembrane regulator. By activating this, they are going to increase intestinal chloride secretion. That in turn is going to increase bowel motility, thereby useful for treatment of constipation, dominant IBS. Here, drug name important, linoclotide, one more drug, plicanotide. Both are guanyl cyclase C stimulator, thereby activating cystic fibrosis transmembrane regulator. It's one group. There's another important secret drug we have that is called as lubiprostone. Lubiprostone. For example, when you say lubiprostone, what is lubiprostone? Lubiprostone actually a derivative of prostaglandin E1. Please note, it's a derivative of prostaglandin E1 and mechanics action. It's a type 3, type 3 Chloride channel activator. Please note all these points are latest Harrison book and latest CMDT book. So please note it's a derivative of prostaglandin E1. Is mechanics action type 3 chloride channel activator, thereby increasing intestinal fluid secretion. That is called secure dagog. By increasing secretion, increasing bowel motility. Thereby useful for treatment of constipation, useful for treatment of constipation, dominant irritable syndrome. That is Louis-Bresson. So, linoclated plicanotides are direct gonyl cyclase activator, thereby noting CFTR. Louis-Bresson is a PGE1 derivative, so type 3 chlorophyll activator. Because of increasing secretion, it is useful for constipation and the commonest side effect, it may cause adverse effect of diarrhea. So question, the most common adverse effect of Lubrostone causing diarrhea and also rarely risk of nauseating feeling, but most importantly causing diarrhea. Okay, and then, and then we have one newer drug called Tenapanor, Tenapanor. It's a small molecular inhibitor of gastrointestinal sodium hydrogen exchange 3 inhibitor. The latest, it is under clinical trial. It is under clinical trial. We have sodium hydrogen exchange 3 inhibitor. Sodium hydrogen exchange 3 inhibitor called Tena. Pinor, it is under clinical trial. Okay, next question. We then the three most important group of drugs useful for treatment of constipation, domain IBS. One group is drugs called laxative. Other group is prokinetic agent. And third is cigarette Now, for treatment of diarrheal domain IBS, what we can do? 
for treatment of diarrheal dominavius big up anti motility agents like opiates anti motility drug opiates and we also have something called bile acid binder or bile acid sequestrants and one more group drug called phygestate 3 antagonist see sir has mentioned there is altered altered phygestate 3 receptors may cause diarrhea so to control that we need some phygestate 3 antagonist so based on the pathology we are moving to treatment no for controlling the diarrhea it's mostly non infective stress related diarrhea so we can use anti motility agent for example among the opiates what they say lopramide one of the cheapest drug a commonest drug and this drug acting mainly on peripheral gat it won't crosses the blood brain barrier and no risk of addiction so advantage so opiate for lopramide a very fantastic drug fd approved drug for treatment of diarrheal dominant ibs and then and then we have how this drug useful for treatment of diarrhea see the opiates may causes a uh, segmental contraction of colon delay the fecal transit increasing anal pressure and reduction in rectal perception so because of this they are reducing the risk of diarrhea there is a low promide on one special point one special point usually all the actions opiate may develop tolerance after some time for example the pain everything get tolerance whereas the low promide do not develop tolerance that's a greatest advantage that is the three action the constipation convulsion and meiosis these action do not develop tolerance so look here there's a greatest advantage because of this advantage lopramid very frequent for example per day two time or three time just suppose the anticipating if we take morning breakfast or lunch or dinner if they suspecting they may go for diarrhea I mean just before the breakfast or dinner or lunch per day per day three time or two time they can be taken lopramid there is advantage no risk of tolerance to the gi activity okay so that's a greatest advantage of lopramide and then yeah another some newer drug we have some other newer drug newer drug for example we have elixirdolin and asimodolin the elixirdolin asimodolin or newer drug they also opiates they useful for controlling diarrhea here one important see question the they causes sphincter of od dysfunction and rarely causes pancreatitis one rare adverse effect they may cause sphincter of od dysfunction and also causing pancreatitis and one more latest point can you please answer anybody name one encephalinase inhibitor name one opiate acting as a encephalinase inhibitor thereby accumulate encephalin that be useful for diarrhea that's called anybody come on resigodotril it's an encephalinase inhibitor useful for controlling diarrhea but among this what you should study even though lot of opiates are there the most commonly used opiate for treatment of diarrheal dominabes will be lopramide lopramide it is easily available over the counter drug three times a day or two times a day can be taken and no risk of addiction and no risk of development of tolerance that's the greatest advantage of lopramide okay and then for treat diarrhea we have another very 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 important concept sir has mentioned no that is a phygestate 3 receptor alteration in the bowel may leads to problem so for that we have something called phygestate 3 antagonist con you may be studied phygestate 3 antagonist or mainly useful for treatment of vomiting you are right like ondansetan granny setan pernosetan useful for treatment diarrhea useful for vomiting but you should know 
there are some pygasty 3 antagonists useful for treatment of diarrhea. For example, we have one drug called allocetron. One more drug called remocetron. One more drug called silencetron. All these are pygasty 3 antagonists useful for treatment diarrhea. In that, allocetron important for your MCQ. Allocetron, a pygasty 3 antagonist useful for treatment of diarrhea. Because of having diarrhea problem, this drug may cause adverse effect of constipation. But the very, very important point, it may cause ischemic colitis. This is the most important point. Allocetron may cause risk of ischemic colitis. That's why you should give informed, get informed consent from the patient. That is, you should explain about allocetron complication get concern from the patient and then try to use. So, allocetron, a drug useful for IBS in female with the diarrheal dominant type, but having high risk of causing ischemic colitis. So, be careful. That is about 5 st 3 and decanus. Okay. Then, we have, there is one more theory, one more hypothesis. They say, bile acid over secretion may cause diarrhea. So, to control this diarrhea, we have some bile acid binders. For example, most commonly we give cholesteramine. Cholesteramine, that is the most famous drug. Or else we can also give cholecevalum. This also can be tried. Some trials prove that cholecevalum also very good drug for treatment of IBS. But most commonly used bile acid sequestrant is cholesteramine. Because over bile secretion may also alter the bowel habit resulting in diarrhea. So, to control that, cholesteramine is a very good choice. So, for treating diarrhea, I mean, first think of anti-motility agents. Next, think of 5 st 3 antagonist. Next, think of bile acid binders. Okay. So, we done treatment for constipation and treatment for diarrhea. The another important problem, clinical symptom, as I just mentioned, no, abdominal spasm, abdomen pain, pain abdomen. There is also no, how frequency the pain occur. There is one criteria to diagnose IBS. So, one of the common complaints, they have abdomen pain. To treat the pain abdomen, we have some anti-spasmodic. We then constipation, we then diarrhea. The third concept is how to manage Abdominal pain or spasm in any case IBS. For this, we have antispasmodic. That is, we have some smooth muscle relaxants. Smooth muscle relaxants. For example, we are having anticholinergic agent like hyosin or dicyclamine. Hyosamine, also called hyosin. One more thing, dicyclamine. All these are anticholinergic agent. Relaxing intestine smooth muscle causes constipation. Useful for treatment diarrhea as well as because of relaxing the intestine, relieving the colicky pain, relieving the spasmodic pain. But be careful, all these are anticholinergic, so risk of the dryness of mouth and then zero stomia, risk of tachycardia, risk of constipation, all these things are there. So you have to Listen this also and try it. Okay, that is called antispasmodic, especially dicyclamine or hyoscine can be a very good choice. Apart from this, the over-the-counter drug called peppermint oil. This is the one important. We have entry coated peppermint oil. It is over-the-counter medication. There are so many trials proved that peppermint oil having smooth muscle relaxing property, very useful for relieving abdominal spasm. In case IBS patient, to relieve the spasm, peppermint oil plays a major role. It's an over-the-counter drug, very good drug for relaxing the intestine muscle. So, anticholinergic or peppermint oil. Okay. And then, other type of antispasmodic drugs. For example, there is some psychological event. The sir mentioned stress brain plays a major prefrontal lobe, plays a major role. And then uh, there is a relationship between brain and the gut. So, 
to control the psychiatry problem and to control the spasm, we can also try some tricyclic antidepressant. See the tricyclic antidepressant like nortriptyline or desipiramine or imipiramine. All these drugs having a good anticholinergic action. They have anti they have anticholinergic action. Because of this action, they have smooth muscle relaxing, smooth muscle relaxing property, thereby also relieving the spasm. Okay. So like tricyclic antidepressant. So in the case the diarrheal patient with the colic, diarrheal patient with the colic pain, with the colic pain, colic means spasmodic pain, we can go for tricyclic antidepressant also because they have uh, anticholic injection and they will delay the oro cycle delay the oro cycle and the whole gut transit time thereby useful for managing diarrhea also and relieving the spasm also suppose they have constipation type of ibs and colic pain for constipation type of ibs and colic pain mean for them we can try ssri ssri like sertraline Cetlaparam or Peroxetine or Fluoxetine, they also tried. Among this, most commonly they train Peroxetine. These drugs causing, we know, one of the adverse effects, they cause diarrhea. They cause diarrhea. So they are useful for treatment of constipation and they also relieve the spasm. They also, so by relieving the stress, I think video not passed, man. For me, video is coming. Okay. Okay. They are controlling. They are controlling the stress. So because most of the IBS products due to stress rate a problem. So when you give this antidepressant like TCA or SSRI, Okay, which is fine. Okay, okay. So question, Peroxetin SSRI can be useful for treatment of constipation dominant type of IBS. Okay. Next. So we done one problem, constipation. Second problem, we done diarrhea. Third problem, we done abdomen pain. The fourth most important problem, they have gas and bloating sensation. That's another common problem. The gas and bloating sensation, they can be managed by some probiotic, some antibiotic. Sir, has mentioned, no, altered gut flora, the fermentation of carbohydrate causing large number of gas production, that causing abdominal distension, bloating sensation, flatulence. To avoid that, we have tried some antibiotic like neomycin, or rifaximine or some probiotic. Among this clinical trial shows rifaximine has greater improvement in treating bloating sensation. Probiotic not proved that much role. They say altered gut flora, we can use some lactobacillus like this, but they are not that much helpful, but their clinical proved that rifaximine plays a major role. It is a very good drug, clinical approved. They are going to uh, improve the symptoms of bloating. So patient with the gas distension, frequently passing gas platelets to control that rifoximine, a wonderful. Another thing, neomycin is a gut sterilizing amino glycosin. It's a gut sterilizer, thereby useful for controlling IBS. So amino glycosin oral. So usually amino glycosides are over, uh, injectable. But neomycin can be used for gut sterilization in case IBS, we can try. And then the most important aspect of treatment of IBS will be 
ask the patient to go for diet modification. Even though say they say drug, 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 comparing to drug, the best treatment will be diet modification. A diet low in FOD maps. What is FOD map? That means low in fermentable, that is low in fermentable oligosaccharide, disaccharide, monosaccharide and polyols. If they are taking this type of diet, definitely it is going to improve. And there is one line in CMDD Harrison's journal, <clears throat> if the diet modification was done properly mean, if they, if they have tension free life mean, most of them there is no need of any drug therapy. This may be the first line therapy. This may first end. So diet modification, lifestyle modification may be the best therapy or first line therapy for IBS. So a diet low in fermentable oligosaccharide, disaccharide, monosaccharide, polyol. This type of diet will be a very good choice. In addition to that, they are recommending some psychological therapy, psychological therapy like cognitive behavior therapy, relaxation technique, yoga and also hypnotherapy, hypnotic therapy. So all this because most of the time the IBS is related to uh, mental tension, mental stress at home. So better to go for some behavior therapy, relaxation technique, yoga therapy and hypnotherapy. This is the best. So even though as a pharmacologist, I started, I, I, I touched upon drug for constipation like laxative, prokinetic agent, and for diarrhea, we discussed about face blocker, bile acid binder, opiates, and for pain, we discussed all the anticholinergic TCA and SSRI, and for bloating sensation, we discussed about probiotic, antibiotic, all these things. But what is the conclusion for treatment IBS? Best is diet modification, stress-free life. That's the best option. Okay. So, we done all the most important aspect how to manage a case of IBS. I just, I will take one or two extra second, one or two time, one, two, two to three minutes. That is, Sir has mentioned the option list. That is, uh, diagnosis IBS and also mentioned about acidity called chronic. So just to one minute, overview of drug useful for IBD is not my topic. Anyway, just to one point, okay, uh, that is for treatment of IBD, we go for sulfasalicin. That is a combination of 5-amino salicylic acid plus sulfa pyridine. Or else we can go for mesalamine, yeah, just a 5-amino salicylic acid, okay. And then for inflammatory bowel disease, steroids are must, like budizonic. And then some immunosuppressants can be tried. For example, asatiprine, cyclosporine, methotrexate. Like that, some immunosuppressant. And then there are TNF alpha blocker like infliximab, adalimab, cetolizumab, golimab. Here, eternacept not approved. That is MCQ. Eter, eternacept, a TNF alpha blocker. It is not approved for IBS. So, which is the TNF alpha blocker not approved for IBD mean? Think of it in a sub. And we have some newer drug like indegrin antagonist. The indegrin blockers are alpha 4 beta 1 indegrin blocker like natalizumab and alpha 4 beta sub blocker vedolizumab. This is expected question. What is natalizumab? What is vedolizumab? Natalizumab is alpha 4 beta 1 indium blocker. Vedolizumab alpha 4 beta 7 indium blocker. And one more new drug, Ustikinumab. Ustikinumab, it's a interleukin 12 and 23 blocker, a new drug useful for IBD. Today, not topic IBD, just to say has mentioned one option. For that, I give an extra point. And then for mole absorption, in case of short bowel syndrome, for treating mole absorption, we have one drug called teduglutide. Remember, we have one drug called teduglutide. Teduglutide, one of the GLP-2 analog. GLP-2 analog. 
it going to improve the nutrition fluid absorption useful in case of short bowel syndrome a case of mal absorption syndrome for treating short bowel syndrome one called tetraglutide tetraglutide one a glp2 analog so for mal absorption we have to go for tetraglutide and for ibd all these drugs and for ivs i discuss constipation and then diarrheal and abdominal pain gas and floatings a bloating sensation okay finally can you please answer my question here i give some image based question please look at the image and give me the answer name one drug useful for ibs that drug is acting as a stimulant of guanyl cyclase c name one guanyl cyclase c stimulant useful for treatment of ibs it's called securedagog going to increases the cft activity thereby increases chloride secretion thereby improve bowel motility the drug is we having linaclotide plicanotide linaclotide plicanotide so this is a image based question can be framed from pharmacology point of view at ibs and then can you please look at this image can can, can you please sum up i have done colonoscopy in the colonoscopy there is a pigmentation in the colon pigmentation of colon this we call melanosis coli melanosis coli anybody name the drug useful for constipation name the drug useful for treatment of constipation causing melanosis coli it is senna senna one of the herbal medicine one of the herbal medicine useful for constipation it may cause melanosis coli and then anybody name one drug useful for treatment of acid peptide disorder causing black color tan name one drug useful for it is called it is called bismuth bismuth okay and then name any one drug causing ischemic colitis just now discuss ischemic colitis useful for treatment ibs let's call allosertone allosertone please allosertone one of the phygst3 antagonists one of the phygst3 antagonists useful for treatment of uh, ibs causes adverse effect of adverse effect of ischemic colitis like that image based question in ibs topic you please read about linoclotide plicanotide lubiprostone these are three important secret drug gog you should know and then anti spasmodic mean anti cholinergic and tca and then for cons diarrhea opioids and then bile acid binding resins and for gas rifaximin neomycin and probiotic i think that finishes whole the most important aspect of pharmacotherapy for ibs i think i covered everything yes sir now over to dr arvin sir uh, thank you uh, dr thiru for such a, a nice uh, and wonderful presentation uh, on the uh, irritable bowel syndrome management as well as you also covered the potential questions uh, uh, image based questions which are very very important so if uh, there is uh, any questions uh, so question is post infectious cause any antibiotic to be given uh, like uh, dr thiru discussed the uh, only antibiotic which is approved and has shown uh, results is rifaximine that is given in a dose of 550 mg twice a day uh, rifaximine uh, for the suspected post infectious uh, uh, causes of the irritable bowel syndrome and uh, uh, yes uh, rightly said ki in ibs the most important treatment or the mainstay of treatment is the dietary modification diet low in the uh, fermentable uh, saccharides fermentable saccharides so that will be uh, as a physician or as a doctor that will be your first prescription the lifestyle modifications and of course stress reduction and uh, rightly said ki medical profession must be having this uh, uh, prevalence of ibs very high because medical professional is the second most common stressful profession in the world 
so yes of course it is uh, common in the medical uh, professionals so uh, any other uh, questions uh, we can take up okay sir all right so if okay, uh, there are no questions so we can wind up the session and thank you once again dr thiru and uh, uh, for all the students uh, all very best for your all your exam yes, uh, any thank you sir thank you sir uh, one question any investigation needed for making the diagnosis or clinical diagnosis is sufficient in ibs there is no investigation it is a purely clinical diagnosis using the help of rome four criteria uh, as such investigation are done to rule out the other pathologies like any inflammatory bowel disease or any malabsorption syndrome to rule out those condition we go for the test otherwise there is no investigation for the uh, ibs uh, about the fod ams uh, diet fod uh, mps diets are usually those fermentable oligosaccharide monosaccharides like for example i will give the example like legumes or uh, you can say mango lychees uh, these uh, after eating them uh, you must have uh, felt bloated so these are the uh, things uh, to be avoided in the diet actually actually we have uh, said sir yeah uh, yeah that 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 nisha yadav yeah. you ask about for uh, for the maps no so they says the avoid such a fructose corn apple honey watermelon lactose fructans wheat based products sorbitol products raffinose products legumes and then sprouts soybeans cabbage all these is, okay so i think i just to go through harrison book man they given uh, the diet modification list also okay and uh, somebody asking about investigation the the one general mention in case ibs don't try to diagnose by too much investigation ask the patient to live with live with the problem they have to cope up the problem it's not a pathological problem it's stress and a problem so advise them purely due to stress ask them to go for some stress modifying therapy that's most important okay yeah, and during the duration of the treatment is mainly symptom based treatment so it can be a, a two months treatment or it may be uh, extended up to one year also depending upon the uh, symptoms and treatment is usually intermittent what we have seen our clinical practice we like uh, for two months we give the treatment patient is okay and then again stress occur the uh, ibs is triggered so it is all variable depending on patient symptom all right so we will finish with the uh, session here and uh, uh, then we can come up with another session of uh, integration of uh, medicine and pharma thank you all of you thank you sir thank you sir thank you to all my dear friends and students thank you thank you